I was the kind of kid that every parent hopes and prays they'll never get. My parents got one, and it wasn't my brother, it was me. I'm the kind of kid that when you would see somebody like me in restaurants or church or library buildings, you'd go, oh, I'd never want one of those. And my father and I had a lot of board meetings. Um, we didn't have an executive table. We had a board at our house I had a ton of meetings with. And uh, I think he was exasperated. He was really at his wits end knowing what to do. It seemed like I had all kinds of energy that was moving every direction but almost always the wrong direction. And uh, I can remember my sister on one occasion saying to my parents, we'd been in a social setting and my, uh, my energy had gotten out of hand and I'd done some pretty foolish stuff. And we were making an early exit and I knew why. Um, they were embarrassed. I'd actually managed to embarrass myself on that occasion. And I was grateful to be leaving the social setting, but as we got in the family car, it got deathly quiet. So quiet that my sister couldn't handle it. She was on the other side of the family car back seat and she said, Dad and Mom, Dwight wants to be good. Um, that didn't seem to go anywhere. Uh, she said, Dad and Mom, Dwight tries to be good. I thought, How do you know? You know what, are you, what are you doing advocating for me? You know, you're, you're my sister. You've never done this before, but you go, girl. Keep it up. And, that's when she dropped the death bomb and she said, Dad and Mom, Dwight wants to be good and he tries to be good, but he can't be good. And I sat in my side of the family car in the back seat looking out the window thinking, man, she's right. I'm sunk. Uh, I'm hopeless. I felt helpless. I didn't know what to do about it. We rode on and I knew what was gonna happen was another one of those infamous board meetings at home. But that's when everything changed. We returned to the house and uh, my father went upstairs to his upstairs office and he called out my name. Dwight, I was in my downstairs bedroom and acted like I didn't hear him, like, you know, maybe I could prolong life a little and, and uh, and that's when he did what every parent does when they want to get the full attention of their child. Dwight Lee Robertson. Whew, I went flying up the stairs, got there as quick as I could, walked through into his office. He said, close the door. And as I closed the door as slowly as I could to just kind of prolong life and not have to enter into this board scene one more time. That's when I turned around and he said, son, I am so tired of this. I know you don't believe that it hurts me worse than it hurts you. And who of us have ever believed that? Um, but that's when he did something he'd never done before. He said, son, uh, I'm going to take your punishment for you today. I didn't know what he meant. Uh, this had never happened before. I kept watching and waiting for signals. And he walked across his office and reached up on the shelf and took down the board I'd had all those meetings with and started walking toward me. And when he did, he just stood there extending it. And when I opened my hands, he put the board in my hands. And then he turned around and stooped over and put his hands on the desk, which was usually this position that I assumed so that my hands would stay out of the way. And then he turned around and said, son, I'll take your punishment for you now. Now I have, haven't had this opportunity. I haven't had an opportunity like this before. So I raised this board as high in the air as I could get it. And I thought, he's going to finally experience the fellowship of my sufferings. You know, <laughs> so here I go. And, and then I intelligently thought, what if this is a test? What if, what if it's a test? I'm going to be in bigger trouble if I follow through. So uh, bored in the air for a while, I thought about it. And then I just tapped him gently. And that's when he whirled around and he said, son, that wasn't punishment. 
I said I'd take your punishment for you, and I will now. And he turned around and put his hands on the desk again. This time, not only my heart was heavy, but the board was heavy. I, I reviewed what I'd done and felt so miserably awful about myself. And I felt ridiculous standing here. Here's my father who it seemed to me had never done a bad thing in his life. And here I am, the one holding the board. And I tried to raise it in the air, but I, I couldn't hold it. And I dropped it. It hit the hardwood floor with a clank. And, and I folded and I said, Dad, punish me, please, please, just punish me. I did it. I did the bad thing. Punish me, please. I'd never begged for it before, but in this moment, I knew who in the room deserved punishment. It was me. And that's when my father whirled around and I could see tears coming down from his face. He said, son, you truly don't know how much I love you, do you? And I realized I didn't. He'd never done anything like this before. And he put his hands on my shoulders and said, son, I would take the punishment for you. I couldn't even look up at him for a moment until he held me for just a brief moment and said, Son, I think what we needed to cover today has been covered. You're loved. You're loved so much. It washed over me in a way that I think for the first time in my life I felt unconditionally loved. I knew my performance deserved punishment, and here he was, extending love and grace and a willingness to even take my punishment for me. It was transformational for me in a horizontal relationship and so profound that as I went to walk out of his office, I thought to myself, whew, nothing like that has ever happened before, ever. And that's when I felt almost a holy, divine tap on the shoulder. You're wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. That's happened before. And I was bewildered for just a split second, like, what? And then flooding through my mind and my heart was an understanding that this wasn't the first time something like that had ever happened. And literally, before I got out of the doorway, I paused, and I knew that was my lit story transformational day. I was loved by the one who sees all, who was willing to take my punishment for me, and said, you are loved. And I felt that love extended to me by a human being who became a representative of a greater love than I had ever known before. My nickname in those days was Dwight the Fright. But that day transformed my life with love and with light. And I would tell you that my lit story is that on that day, I began to live into the fullness of being Dwight, caught up in the light of love that transformed me in a single day, in a single moment, you're loved that same way. Every day, everywhere, ordinary people in ordinary places and ordinary ways can make a, a huge, extraordinary impact. Forge sends speakers itinerantly across the nation, around the world, to help people deepen that intimate relationship with God. And we provide equipping programs of all sorts, camps, conferences, summer training programs for youth and young adults, all designed to help people at every age and in every facet and sphere of life. And through Forge content, video, audio, print, be a fueled life so that as they enter their spaces and places as boots on the ground that deliver God's plans and purposes, they can lead a life high impact.